new cocktails. First tonight, Maine has more than 120 cold cases involving unsolved homicides and missing persons dating back to the 1950s. Mary Tanner's death is one of those cases. 207's Beth McAvoy joins us now with more on her story. Hi, Beth. Hi, guys. More than 43 years ago, Mary Tanner was found murdered. She was just 18. Now, decades later, Tanner's death remains a mystery a mystery that has consumed journalist Rick O'Neill for years. Mary was just a real character, always wore the knees out of her, of her pants in the summertime because she was always going barefoot. She was just this rambunctious, joyous child. Mary Tanner grew up the youngest of four children in a blue collar family in Kennebunk. Journalist Rick O'Neill never met Mary, but he feels like he knows her. <laughs> One of the favorite stories about her though was that she her mother caught her with cigarettes and uh, Mary explained that she was smoking the cigarettes down for the bum on the on Main Street who wouldn't smoke unsmoked cigarettes and that she would smoke them and put them in a bag and leave them for him. Uh, whether it was true or not, but that was perfectly in character with Mary doing something for someone like that, even if it meant, well, you know, having to smoke. <laughs> O'Neill was first introduced to the story of Mary when he covered a memorial service held for her in 2013. All of her friends came and filled that church and uh, the, the minister who was her minister during her youth spoke very movingly about her uh, and I, I instantly became, became uh, emotionally involved with Mary because I, I just something about her and the way people talked about her was, was, was so genuine. O'Neill has spent the last eight years poring over the details of the last few days of her life as he works on a documentary about her unsolved murder. She loved to party, uh, not saying she was a party girl. That's a different species of animal. Uh, Mary was just sort of an average uh, person in many ways. Mary had just turned 18 and learned she was pregnant. She was trying to enjoy the summer before her senior year of high school. On Friday, July 7th, 1978, she started out the day by going to the annual Miss Dumpy Parade in Kennebunk Port. Mary went then to a party on the hill, which is an area of land on Route 9 where the kids gathered and you could see the cops coming from any direction so they would get back in there and drink beer and, and uh, smoke. Afterwards, she went to the Kennebunk Beach with two friends. I caught up with O'Neill as he was filming some of the recreation scenes at the beach. Mary was upset. She was crying. Her boyfriend's brother and friend had just been killed in a car accident. Mary was anxious to get home so her father could take her to Massachusetts the next day for the funeral. She left the beach and parted ways with her friends. And I remember someone had said, oh, Mary wouldn't have just thumbed a ride home with a stranger. And I'm like, well, we did it all the time. We did it all the time. She was just in a full panic, late, worried about getting home. She was always late, but she was never, I've never seen her that upset. Bill Lawrence says he saw Mary around 10.30 Friday night. I saw her starting to get into a car, open the back door, and I yelled at her, I said, Mary, stop, wait, don't get in that car, just wait for me, I'll be right there. And she looked at the car, I looked at me, looked at the car, and I said again, Mary, don't, do not get in that car. That's our, always our rule. We go together or we walk. And next thing I know, she jumped in. We normally hitch together. Yeah. Right. So when we left her that night, let me tell you, my friend, I, if I could take that night back, if I could take that five minutes back. Mary Tanner was last seen alive on the Melsom River Bridge around midnight. Two days later, a pilot spotted something unusual. I kind of just glanced, you know, out the window to look at the trees and look at the ground, make, you know, get an idea how high you are. I was pretty sure it was a person with no clothes on. She was at Gracie Evans Field in Lyman, just over the Kennebunk line, her body severely beaten. You know, he said, there's, there's a woman down there dead, you know. Somebody call the police. Well, I mean, it was shock. And uh, the minister said it was the first time in his life he locked his door. There was no more going out for the kids alone or even in groups, they were home with after dinner and they start home. O'Neill has spoken to dozens of friends and relatives, sifting through their memories of Mary and the details leading to her death. 
there are memories that are at, this, at absolute odds, yes. And, and we are not going to try to explain that or resolve it. His documentary is called Girl on the Bridge. We're going to just let it stand, let them tell their stories. And I guess just like I had to, the, the viewer is going to have to make up their mind. Setbacks to his health forced him to push the release date of the film to next summer. I definitely dedicated to finishing the story. I'm a journalist. I don't, I don't start stories that I can't finish. Um, I didn't mean to be waylaid by back surgery and heart surgery in 2017 and 18, but it happened. And I remember thinking in the hospital, it's going to take me a long time to get back, but I've got to do this. One thing O'Neill wants to make clear. I never wanted to find Mary's killer. It wasn't our job. It's no that we are not equipped to do that. But through his years of research, O'Neill has drawn his own conclusions. My gut tells me, like a lot of people, is someone who lives there. Um, I believe this person is still alive. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that maybe enough can be made of this film and that the, the guy will say, well, uh, maybe it's time to own up. While he hopes for justice, what O'Neill really wants is to celebrate the life of the girl on the bridge. I love her to death, and I think she would have been a great kid to have around. E even in memory, she has this hold on people's hearts. Now, Lieutenant Scott Goslin of the Maine State Police's Major Crimes Unit told me they've not received any significant leads in the last few years about Mary Tanner's case. He did say the documentaries and even podcasts of this kind can be helpful to police. They can even sometimes bring up new leads. It'll be interesting to see. This will obviously shine a light on that case in a way that hasn't happened for decades. Right. See where it goes. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth.